As those who know me will attest, I do tend to look for the positive. And today provides me with an ideal opportunity to reflect on how Ted Heath, Sir Edward Heath, inspired an entire generation of young people to join the Conservative Party and actively to pursue careers within it. And I hope, I hope you feel this will be a positive lecture. Sadly, in order to be positive, it is sometimes necessary also to address some negatives. It's an open secret that politicians can be very exercised over the judgment of posterity. In Shakespeare's Othello, when Cassio is discredited, he cries out, Reputation, reputation, reputation. Oh, I have lost my reputation. I have lost the immortal part of myself and the rest is bestial. Well, that arch manipulator, Iago, who has personally and insidiously orchestrated the ruin of Cassio's reputation, responds by saying, Reputation is an ideal and most false imposition, oft got without merit and lost without deserving. Reputation is the principal theme of my lecture today. Specifically, a reputation that could be lost without deserving. May I first explain why, why Sir Edward Heath's reputation, Ted's reputation, matters? It should matter to us all because he attained the highest office in politics and was responsible for redefining British politics. It matters particularly to me because of the very significant role that Ted played in my own personal and political development. It is hard, no, impossible to justify all Ted's attitudes, his words and his actions in those long years of self-imposed exile that followed his loss of the party leadership in January 1975. On occasions, Ted did, of course, make a powerful case for an alternative form of conservatism, one firmly rooted in the one nation tradition. On other occasions, however, he allowed his loneliness, his sense of alienation, and yes, perhaps even a degree of bitterness to cloud his judgment. That is far from being the whole story, however, and the unhappiness of those times must not blind us to the earlier service by him and, of course, his successes. Not everyone in politics can remember the exact moment when he or she decided to embark on the precarious journey that is any political career. Well, I can. I was inspired actively to engage in party politics on Friday the 22nd of January 1965 when I was a student at the University of Bristol. It was on that evening that I first met the Shadow Chancellor, Ted Heath. The occasion was a confidence motion, a debate about the first government led by Harold Wilson, which had been elected less than three months earlier and was clinging to office by a thread. The event attracted over a thousand students to the very grand Victoria rooms at the university, which dated back to 1842. The outside speakers were Ted and for the then Labour government, Michael Stewart, the Secretary of State for Education. This confidence motion was moved by the leader of the University Labour Club, Peter Reid, and I was asked to lead for the opposition. The debate was preceded by a dinner where I met Ted for the first time. What an inspiration. 
All those who attended that dinner were very impressed indeed, first by his ability to listen, but then most of all by his enthusiastic endorsement of the highest possible principles and standards in public life. He also treated us not as jumped up whippersnappers, but as colleagues worthy of respect in a debate that really mattered. I realised that this formidable parliamentarian, one of the leading lights of his generation, already spoken of as a statesman of international standing and as a future Prime Minister, really, really wanted to win that debate. It was this determination and ability to focus that had brought him to the vital role of Shadow Chancellor under Alec Hume, the role in which Ted really made his mark. It was the same competitive streak that led him just six months later to take up sailing for the first time in his life, not as a leisurely pursuit, but as a fast and dangerous competitive sport. In sailing, as in everything else, Ted wanted to be the best. He wanted to win the Fastnet and the Admiral's Cup, and he did. As a talented amateur, amateur musician, he wanted to conduct the great orchestras, in particular the Berlin Philharmonic, at that time headed by the prickly Herbert von Karrion, always a good foil for Ted. All right, said Karrion, after years of nagging, you can conduct my orchestra, but what piece do you want to conduct? After a moment's thought, Ted replied, Bruckner's Symphony No. 8. Now, for the uninitiated, that piece is 90 minutes long and one of the great monoliths of the late classical repertoire. Typical Ted. Some, year, some years after Ted took up competitive sailing, one of those Tory grandees asked him if he'd been on his boat recently. Ted's response is not suitable for a family occasion like this. In our conversation over that fateful dinner, I remember we focused principally on the European question. My enthusiasm for debating had been regularly stoked by encouraging telegrams from our Chancellor at Bristol University, Winston Churchill. Ted, of course, knew Sir Winston well and had proved his own credentials as a debater by becoming president of the Oxford Union Society. So I shared with Ted how Sir Winston, perhaps, perhaps the greatest of Ted's mentors and supporters, had also inspired me, not least by contributing so much in his latter years by calling on the nations of Europe to unite. At first, as we, can reach in, as we can read in his celebrated Zurich speech in, in September 1946, Sir Winston was concerned primarily that the traditional continental combatants, France and Germany, must learn the habit of working together. Latterly, however, he had become persuaded that Britain too should play a leading role in the process of European integration. Little, little did we know, but even as we spoke enthusiastically about the inspiration that he had given us both, that great man was then on his deathbed and Sir Winston would die just two days later. And we then went into the debate. That fateful night, Ted Heath spoke with passion and skill. He was unstoppable. After he'd spoken, and just before Michael Stewart got up to sum up the government's case, I was given a note to pass to Ted Heath. I did, he read it, and he immediately rose to his feet, interrupting Michael Stewart and said, I know the House will be interested to know and to congratulate the Education Secretary on tonight 
having been appointed Foreign Secretary. Michael Stewart had indeed been contacted by the then Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, earlier that day with news of this elevation, but he had been unaware that the announcement was about to be made. He duly rose to acknowledge the news, and what a historic moment that was. The following day, Saturday the 23rd of January 1965, the Times headlined the news with ovation from a thousand students. The story ran, Mr. Stewart's appointment was announced at a Bristol University parliamentary night. He was given three minutes standing ovation by 1,000 students. This gave rise to my first ever letter to the Times, headed Bristol debate, and I wrote a swift rejoinder. I had no desire to detract from Michael Stewart's understandable pride at attaining one of the great offices of state, but I did feel it necessary to point out that the debate had ended with a division in which the students of Bristol, by a majority of two to one, showed they had no confidence in the government. Ted won that debate and won it well. I subsequently became a passionate and enthusiastic chairman of the Bristol University Conservative Association and swiftly lined up an interesting selection of speakers, including Enoch Powell and Reginald Maudling. But when we students watched the result of the first ever election in July 1965 for the leader of the Conservative Party, we all knew why Ted had won outright with 150 votes to Reginald Maudling's 133 and Enoch Powell's 15. From that, from that moment onwards, I decided that I was going to seek a parliamentary career. And just the following year, I was selected as prospective Conservative parliamentary candidate for the safe Labour seat of Bristol South. And then when the general election came in 1970, I led hundreds of schoolchildren to welcome Ted Heath to Bristol. Douglas Heard recently told me that he still remembers the occasion. I went round all the local schools and persuaded the teachers to release the children to welcome the leader of the opposition. Sadly, there was a thunderstorm, but all the tiny tots, as described by Douglas Heard, were lined up all wearing the slogan, I trust Ted. And my relationship with the leader never looked back from that moment on. When I became National Young Conservative Chairman, Ted was Prime Minister and actively encouraged me to come in and see him at number 10. Indeed, he gave me a small card with a direct telephone number and told me to call at any time. And to my amazement, I used to get through we would go in and share our views on the great matters of the day. I always remember in the corner was this marvellous man taking notes and every now and again Ted would say, Mr. Hurd, will you see to that? <laughs> Ted inspired in other ways too. I shall never ever forget the leadership he demonstrated in his courageous decision to admit the Uganda nations who were in grave danger. At the Conservative Conference in 1972, there was a rather innocuous seeming motion on immigration to be proposed by one Harvey Proctor of Hackney, South and Shoreditch. But suddenly we were told that the motion would in fact be moved by the president of Hackney, South and Shoreditch, who I don't think anybody realized was Mr. Enoch Powell. There was much consternation, and it was clear from the outset that Enoch was going to use the occasion to censure the government. Ted had every incentive to buckle, but he did not. Instead, he decided to challenge, to tackle this challenge head on, and I was the young David sent in to slay the Goliath by moving an amendment to the motion. And with the full support of the Prime Minister and the unusually forthright but quietly spoken 
even diffident Home Secretary Robert Carr. He went on to the platform before a, a raucous, unsettled audience and made a defiant and courageous speech. He told delegates, by standing up to extremism, we struck a blow for freedom, for a multiracial society, and for making sure that when we give people British passports, we don't take them away when they're in trouble. As Robert Carr said to me some years later, when the chips were down, Ted was pure gold. Enoch Powell and I were the only tellers in that card vote, and the first to know that I and the government had defeated him by a margin of two to one. Enoch himself was perfectly civil about the outcome, but not everyone was happy, especially in my own immediate circles. Although the Conservatives in Plymouth Drake had by now selected me as their prospective parliamentary candidate, technically they had still to adopt me as their actual candidate. A special meeting was called, and unfortunately the then rules allowed people to join on the door. Hundreds of people poured into that room for the adoption meeting, including many members of the National Front, and I was duly unadopted and sacked. My political career was in ruins. I went back to my home in Bristol the following day, feeling somewhat desolate, sat down and turned on the television news. And there was Ted on the screen, our Prime Minister on the steps of number 10, saying goodbye, seeing off Don Mintoff, the Prime Minister of Malta. Westminster to me seemed a whole world away. Then suddenly the phone went, and it was the Prime Minister. I shall never, ever forget that conversation. Ted told me, David, if you stand up for your principles, you'll never lose. So you must fight on, and you'll win. Well, I've done my best since then to live up to that. There are three main canards about Ted, three well-worn and unjust methods to traduce him. Two had currency during his lifetime, and the third, much the most squalid and vicious, is a much more recent occurrence. The first great untruth is that Ted was a weak and indecisive Prime Minister. It is true that he set out on one path, a clear path that, to my mind, made him the clear forerunner of one who followed, namely Margaret Thatcher. For some reason, this was never a theory that commended itself to Ted, but he was the first leader of the Conservative Party to recognise that the nation needed to modernise, to adapt to the demands of a new world. It is also true that he changed path when in office, Ted was a one-nation politician. In 1950, a pro and proud co-founder of the group that bore that name, along with the likes of Robert Carr and also Enoch Powell. Ted regarded class war, indeed any form of civil strife, as unconscionable folly. Rich versus poor. Managers versus workers, cities versus countryside. Ted was a rational man. He had, of course, seen for himself how the nation could come together in wartime for a common shared purpose, and he wished to see it do the same in peacetime. He recognised and deplored the, the utter futility of any group in society fighting any other group. He saw human, human existence as a shared endeavour and sincerely believed most, politics, most problems could be solved by gathering reasonable people of good character in a room and having them work together. You might even say there was an essential optimism in his nature. 
When unemployment hit one million in January 1972, Ted did not see that as being in any sense a price worth paying. Unlike those who followed, he remembered the Great Depression, which he had seen at first hand. He, and he had fought alongside people from all walks of life in the Second World War. He balked at the thought that entire families were without work and without a breadwinner. He believed there had to be a better way and that it was his responsibility to seek it out. As inflation soared, as the oil crisis took a grip, as industrial strife blighted the country, and this country came as close as it ever has to a second civil war, Ted sought out that better way as a patriot who wanted the best for his country. Yes, he failed, but I don't believe anyone else could have succeeded. It didn't help that Ted was a relatively poor communicator. He lacked the easy charm that the likes of Joe Grimmond and Dennis Healy brought to the airwaves. Harold Wilson, in contrast, was an adept, even consummate communicator. He worked brilliantly through the medium of television. In today's world, Harold Wilson would probably be a master of Twitter, using its immediacy with intelligence and wit, charm and acute political judgment, rather as President Trump does. <laughs> and I simply cannot imagine Ted on Twitter, the very thought of it. He was what he was, for better or for worse. Roy Jenkins likened him to a great lighthouse radiating out his steady beam, indifferent to the seething seas below. That is what political leadership is all about. The second great lie about Ted relates to his time as Prime Minister and also to a sustained bravura performance he gave in 1975, the year after he lost office. Then the year 1974 was an annus horribilis for Ted Heath. At the beginning of February, barely three and a half years into a five-year term of office, he decided to call an early general election. His timing couldn't have been worse. On the 28th of January, okay, the Conservatives received more votes than Labour, but won slightly fewer seats. Ted's wily old adversary, Harold Wilson, had outmaneuvered him again and returned to Downing Street as the head of a minority administration. And then the year got worse. In the months that followed, Ted narrowly escaped an attempt on his life by Irish terrorists, and his godson, Christopher Chad, died when Ted's racing yacht, Morning Cloud, was destroyed in a freak storm. And then in October 1974, this time at a at a moment of Wilson's choosing, Labour won a narrow majority. So as 1975 dawned, Ted was already a frustrated man. More and more of his colleagues saw him not as a man for the future, but as a liability, a relic of a failed experiment. Margaret Thatcher challenged him for the leadership, and for once, she who wielded the dagger dagger did go on to wear the crown. In the space of a year, Ted had lost almost everything. His reputation, his office, his home, and seemingly his role at the forefront of our public life. What a measure of the man that he took a brief holiday and returned refreshed and reinvigorated to the fray, ready to lead the pro-European troops in the referendum that Harold Wilson had called on our membership of the European Union. Wilson did not, of course, believe in referendums. His party was divided over Europe and he thought the best way of holding it together was to hold a referendum and allow party members, up to and including senior members of the cabinet, to campaign on opposite sides. That would let all the steam out and everyone could then be friends again. It, it didn't work, of course. Six years later, the Labour Party split and the SDP was formed. Which is presumably why no subsequent Prime Minister would ever dream of trying anything similar. Oh. 
Sorry. Oh, dear. In his later years, Ted grew increasingly frustrated, upset, and indignant at the rising influence of your Eurosceptics. He called them Eurosceptics within the party that he had once led with distinction. With a heavy heart and a gloomy expression, he predicted the day would come when the British people would again turn their backs upon the European Union. The steady trickle of anti-European ret rhetoric in so many newspapers, actuated more by fear of the regulatory power of the EU than by any serious defense of our national interest, was to his mind, the most pernicious feature of our age. So the second sustained assault on Ted's reputation and good name came in response to his dogged defense of Britain's place in Europe. It also happened during his lifetime and I know it hurt him deeply. This was the groundless charge that he had deliberately concealed from the people the political nature of European ut unity. He was called a traitor and worse. Sometimes a bag containing pieces of silver would arrive in his office. Fortunately, his staff knew better than to share this with him. Always the accusers were anonymous. They were the forerunners of today's so-called trolls. An effigy of Ted was burned every year on the 5th of November. An effigy of an, a, man, a man who had immediately volunteered to serve his nation when war was declared in September 1939 and who went on to do so with great distinction, having his precious hearing irreparably damaged in the process. Nonetheless, Europe has been somewhat in the news in recent times, so let us examine the accusation that he misled the voters. In the 1990s, it became the practice of many Europe haters to claim Ted lied about the aspirations of political unity that are inherent in the Treaty of Rome and duplicitly claiming it was just about trade. That lie suited their purposes with consequences we still see today as the miserable saga of Brexit plays slowly out. In fact, it's highly instructive to compare and contrast the miserable, even humili humiliating experience of 2016 with the previous referendum of 1975. I thought I would just share with you a few of the things that Ted did say or write as he sought to persuade the voters to support continued British membership of the European Economic Community. On the 9th of April 1975, as the referendum loomed, Ted said this in the House of Commons, and this was in the days when the proceedings of the House of Commons were widely reported. I quote, The primary purpose of the European community when it was founded was a political purpose, to absorb the new Germany into the structure of the European family and the economic means were adapted for that very political purpose. Today, the issue is still a great political issue. That is the reason for my regret, said Ted, that the Prime Minister placed the whole of his emphasis on a difference in arrangements and completely avoided any mention, any mention of what I believe is the supreme issue here. The question we have to decide, therefore, in carrying through this great political purpose for the peace and freedom of Europe and of our own country is how we are entitled to use the measure of sovereignty which is required. On the 25th of April, in another widely reported speech, Ted said this, of course a country like an individual can decide to go it alone and in theory at least they may appear to have more freedom but freedom to do what free to buy what you want but too poor to afford it free to say whatever you like but too weak for anyone to listen this is a sham sovereignty and a fictional freedom then 
Then there was the celebrated speech he gave in Edinburgh on Thursday the 22nd of May 1975, which was dutifully press released by Conservative Central Office. He said, six nations took pass, part in the historic step of founding the European Economic Community. This was much more than a common market. It was a community in the real sense of the word, going well beyond a customs union. It was a positive act of genuine political cooperation. I could go on. But let me end this recitation of Ted with a great favourite of mine, an article which he wrote in the Times newspaper on the 2nd of June 1975, just three days before the people voted. The British understandably look back to 1940 as a shining example of how Britain decided to go it alone and succeeded. For a time we did, and Europe will be forever grateful to us for it. But it was with friends and allies that we won through. It is a tragedy that Britain has allowed herself to succumb to the delusion that the splendid isolation of the Victorian age was the norm rather than the exception. And some are still promoting the myth that in the modern world Britain can survive alone. So once again the British people are having to catch up with reality. So much for Ted the Dissembler. He could not have been clearer or more blunt about what was at stake. I don't know anyone who would claim the 2016 referendum on our membership of the European Union was a splendid model of honest political campaigning at its best. In my opinion, neither of the national campaigns covered itself in glory. I say this as a lifelong supporter of freedom of expression and the free press, neither did most of our national newspapers. Conjecture was portrayed as fact, lies as truth, bogus figures as reputable analysis, Project Fear was run over by a big bad red bus, and at the beginning of the 1975 campaign the polls were touch and go, and in the end the, the voters, the nations, voted to remain by a margin of two to one. No fewer then and 85% of Conservative voters supported our continued membership of the EEC. That was almost entirely Ted's achievement. In 2016, the equivalent figure was just 42%, precisely half as many. If only later generations of pro-European politicians had been half as courageous, half as passionate half as honest as Ted Heath had been in 1975, especially in the 2016 referendum campaign, we might be in a very different position today. If his narrow vic victory at Bexley marked a high point in Ted's life and his unexpected victory in June 1970, another then the result of the 1975 referendum was surely the third. From down and out to hero of the hour. Well, in conclusion, let me talk about another aspect in which the name of Ted Heath has been viciously dragged through the mud. The third and final assault on his reputation has come in, in recent times. I was chairman, before John, of the Sir Edward Heath Charitable Foundation until earlier this year, and in that role I felt it was inappropriate for me to make extensive public comments on the accusations that had been made against Ted that he sexually assaulted young people. Now, now I have stepped down from that role, I feel no such inhibition. Is it not striking? that not one person who knew Ted personally believes there to be one scintilla of truth in these accusations. It may shock you, but 
But not everyone who knew Ted loved and admired him. Even those who disliked him and his brand of politics rec recognize these accusations for what they are, pathetic fantasies and deliberate knowing lies. Ted cannot defend himself against the web of deceit. Fortunately, others can and have defended themselves. Sir Cliff Richard, Paul Gambaccini, Lord Bramall, a hero who served his country nobly, my late friend and founder of the Holocaust Educational Trust, Greville Janner, Harvey Proctor, the late Leon Britton, could and should have been informed that the cases against him had been exposed as a tissue of lies before he died, but he was not. The powers, the powers that be, unaccountably and absurdly, decreed unilaterally some years ago that anyone making allegations of sexual abuse against a public figure, however lurid and outlandish those accusations appeared to be, should not, should not only be given a sympathetic hearing, they should be treated and described as a victim. Ted Heath, who served this country with distinction in peace and in war, it is now Ted who is the real victim, a victim of unspeakable slander. Those who were complicit in creating and sustaining the slur against him must now realize they have lost comprehensively. Nonetheless, because he's dead, Ted is denied complete justice. He has no opportunity to defend himself. The Crime Commissioner for Swindon and Wiltshire and also Ministers of the Crown have indicated they would support, indeed would like to see, a judge-led inquiry look properly into these accusations once and for all, but they will not take the necessary action to make it happen. So I say, in lieu of any such inquiry, let the, unequiv the unequivocal message go out from this place today, loudly and clearly, not one remotely credible accusation against Ted Heath has been made. These rank emanations from the dark web should be dispatched back whence they came. Ted Heath was no abuser, just as he, just he was no weakling, and he was no liar. I talked about how Ted had sought out the common ground. In the battle between rich and poor, or managers and workers, or employers and trade unions, there are ultimately no winners. Ted recognized that and sought always to find the common ground. Not, not, not some mythical center ground, but the common ground that unites. I see a clear parallel in the policies and philosophy of our current Prime Minister, Theresa May. We read a lot about a moment, at the moment, about letters from MPs demanding a leadership contest. I just ask, are these people insane? Rightly and properly, the chairman of the 1922 committee, backbench MPs, refuses to reveal how many such letters he has received. As chairman of the Association of Conservative Peers, the equivalent body in the House of Lords, may I please let you into a secret? And of course I sit on the board of the Conservative Party. I have received no such letters. Not one such letter. The only representations I have received from my fellow Conservative Peers are full of anger and indignation about the disloyalty to our Prime Minister. By refusing to bow to pressure from the two extremes, the Prime Minister demonstrates her desire to reunite the nation, to ensure that the scar of Brexit can and must be allowed, indeed actively encouraged, to heal. Yes, a majority of those who voted in the referendum voted to leave, 
but 52% does not equal 100%, just as 48% does not equal zero. A binary proposition conceals the common ground. As the Prime Minister has said, we may be leaving the European Union, but we are not leaving Europe. Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, which enables a member state to secede from the EU if it wishes to, requires the Union at that quote to negotiate and conclude an agreement with that state, setting out the arrangements for its withdrawal, taking account of the framework for its future relationship with the Union. We cannot afford for there to be a vacuum after March 2019. So it is vital that we focus now not upon the past but upon the future. There are those who would have this great nation of ours withdraw from the world stage by cutting off our links to our closest neighbours and allies. That would not only betray Ted and everything the Conservative Party has stood for for the past 50 or 60 years. It would also be bad for Britain and bad for the world. We certainly owe it to Ted to obliterate any remaining taint resulting from the vile accusations that have been made against him. The greatest tribute to him, however, would be to ensure that as we leave the European Union, we set about building a new and positive relationship with our European friends and colleagues. There have indeed been times when this nation has stood alone, but it is not something we have ever chosen voluntarily to do. Ted understood that, and I'm convinced our Prime Minister understands that. And despite all the sound and fury accompanying Brexit, I believe the Conservative, Conservative Party still overwhelmingly recognises that too. We should make peace with the past, but not dwell on it. So let us, let us look now to the future, inspired by Ted and his vision. Take care.